be prepared to open God's word and hear from him tonight. Would you do that with me? Hebrews chapter uh, 5 is where we're going to be, although uh, as we read that portion of scripture together, we are going to back up a few verses and just read the end of Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, Phil did an incredible job with this text last week. Uh, but it's just too good not to read with the beginning of five. And it kind of has uh, some things in, in common, some, some thoughts we don't want to miss. So I'm going to go back to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 14. And then read through Hebrews chapter 5 and read the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 5. I'd love for your eyes to be on the text tonight to allow God to speak to you personally. Um, Something happens when, when we see the words of God and we hear his, his still, small voice, and it just helps us really hold on to it. So maybe on your phone or your tablet or a Bible in the back, I'd love for your eyes to be on it, but uh, it'll also be on the screen as well. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And we go into Hebrews chapter 5. It says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I thank you that I did not butcher that last name too badly, Lord. That's by your grace. And uh, God, we ask you to just to speak to us, Lord. I mean, we, we come here before you, and uh, we just we all need something different from you some comfort and some peace and some for their worries to be quieted and let your voice drown out those fears. And and Lord, we just come as your children. We we sit before you hungry, hungry for a word from you, God. Move powerfully in our lives, Jesus. You are the one who removes hearts of stone. And, and, And Lord, would you do that tonight? Any walls we've built up, Uh, Lord, Lord, knock them down and let your truth just radiate from the Scripture. We just give you all all access to our heart, our mind, everything, Jesus. Have your way in us tonight. Amen. You know, I believe all of that is true. I don't know about you, but are you ever surprised when the Lord answers your prayer? Uh, are you ever surprised when you, you beg him to show up in a part of your life and he does? And it's like, whoa, you actually came through. And, and I am, I, I've, been, I've been praying the last couple days for some things and, and God shows up and it's like every time I'm surprised and he kind of looks at me like, when are you going to stop being surprised? And so maybe that's a great prayer for you tonight. God, would you just would you speak to me? I'm so, I'm so desperate for a word from you and, and I believe that he'll, he'll meet you there. Well, if you know me, if you know anything about me, if you've ever sat down and talked to me or asked me any questions about my, my hobbies and my passions and, and my desires in life, or if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, uh, you, you've probably come to some conclusions about me. And one of those conclusions you've probably come to is that I am not in any way, shape, or form a thrill seeker at all. In fact, I generally like to have both feet planted on the ground whenever I can and, and, and make sure things are, are pretty safe. I am not an adrenaline junkie by any stretch of the imagination, and I am not someone who likes to flirt with death at all. 
And some of you guys, you tough guys out there would be like, well, you're not a man. And I'm like, cool, I'll just sit over here and play table tennis and do puzzles and all this safe stuff while you go risk your life. Uh, how many of you, just by show of hands, I'd love some participation, have ever been skydiving? Why? <laughs> how many of you haven't been skydiving and you're like, I would totally want to go skydiving? What's your problem? The plane works, people. You don't have to jump out of it. It's flying just fine. You can stay in it till it lands and, and your chances of dying are very minimal, okay? I don't understand people like that. In fact, recently I was asked to go skydiving with some buddies and uh, before they could even finish the sentence, I blurted out rather rudely, no way, fat chance. There's no way I'm doing that with you. I don't care if you never talk to me again. I'm not going skydiving. And it's not just skydiving either. I've never had an interest of, of riding a Harley or a motorcycle. Um, I get freaked out when I'm in my Prius on the 60 through the mountains and the semis are there. I'm like, no motorcycle for this guy, okay? Um, I have no interest in swimming with sharks. I don't care what the cage is like or, or anything. I'm not going in the water with them. No way. It, bungee jumping, even changing a light fixture in my house, I won't do it. I would, I, I would surely electrocute myself and I married someone who knows that about me because anytime there's something handy to be done, she's like, we're calling someone. We're calling someone. Thank you, Jesus. So I often look at people who have extremely dangerous jobs and, and when I see them performing their jobs, I just have these little moments of, of praise and worship that go something like this. Thank you, Jesus. It's not me. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not, I'm not the one doing it. You couldn't pay me enough money to wash the windows on a skyscraper, you couldn't. You could offer me $6 million. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, some of you watch uh, Deadliest Catch on Discovery Channel. I'm not going fishing on the Bering Sea. I don't care how good the crab tastes. I'm not doing it. I'll just pay the 30 bucks a pound to eat it once it's on land, okay? And I always think there's a reason why those people don't qualify for life insurance. Think about it. It's because they're, they're probably going to die doing their job. I was recently traveling in Uganda, which I get to do often because the Lord loves me and it's a passion. And I was traveling in this, this van and uh, we we're traveling through the city of Jinja where the head waters of the River Nile are, which is a crazy cool experience. And, it, and it, it's kind of unfair because they have all these signs like, don't take pictures. And you're like, what? It's the Nile. Like, I want to take pictures. So I never take pictures while I'm driving across the bridge. But every time I go to Jinja, I'm driving across the bridge and there's this one way across and it gets crazy busy. And they're building this new bridge uh, in the distance and, and you can see them building it. And, and over the last few trips, I've had the, the the kind of the privilege of see this happen uh, over over the months it's been going on and every time we get a little more done and is it done yet not done yet man they've been working on it forever right and and, and i i watch them and i have that that moment of worship lord thank you that i am not a bridge builder because every time i drive by there's men climbing and hanging from the structures they secure cabling as they are, are building the frame all while hanging over the murky waters of the nile river not going to happen not with this guy right anyone who wants to risk their life in such occupations have my full support because building bridges is dangerous work it's it's, it's inherently dangerous when they were building the brooklyn bridge uh just Oh, that's embarrassing. Everybody silence your phone and your watches at this time. It was my sister. That was the rudest part. She's probably watching on Facebook Live and called me anyways. What gives? <laughs> Building bridges is dangerous work. Just about 30 people died building the Brooklyn Bridge. But building bridges is, is so important because without bridges, we'd never get to where we need to be. Bridges take us from where we are to where we need to be. So praise the Lord for bridge builders. I would imagine that if I would have lived in the days of Moses and the ancient Israelites, I would have felt the same way about those whose occupation was the priesthood. And we read our verses tonight talking about the priests and the high priests. And it's an occupation I look at and I go, man, thank the Lord. I, I, I wasn't a priest in, in ancient Israel. They were the ones chosen to build and be a temporary bridge between a holy God and a sinful people. And it was incredibly dangerous work. 
It, it demanded certain training and, and certain safety protocols be met before ever attempting to do the work. And we're going to unpack some of that in a little bit and talk about what that looked like and, and how those high priests would, would, would be a bridge that connected the people of God to a holy God. But, but before we do that, I just want to start with kind of this disclaimer. If I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, I said it for the very, the very first week that we started this series. The Old Testament always serves as a funnel that brings everything to Jesus. Everything we read in the Old Testament points, it leads to the Messiah coming and rescuing people. The writer of Hebrews, being Jewish, is keenly aware of this. And what he does over this whole book from chapter 1 all the way to the end is he uses Old Testament references to remind us that the story of God's redemption of humanity, the saving of people, didn't start when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and we sing Silent Night and we celebrate Christmas and that's great. The story of God's redemption started in the Garden of Eden. And from Genesis all the way to the coming of the Savior, it was building like a good movie, this climactic moment for God to intervene and intercede finally on behalf of people. It's a plan that unfolded. It, it developed and paved the way for the Messiah to come right at the perfect time in history. And we've seen this over the last five weeks that this book is rich. It is, it is saturated with, it is dripping with Old Testament references about Jewish priests, about sacrifices, about prophets, about the founding fathers of the faith, and, and on and on. All of these Old Testament um, um, references he's making that a Jewish audience would understand and relate to. And this is exactly what the writer of this book does in chapter 5. As we start this chapter tonight, he uses God's work in the Old Testament. He uses a system and a way of doing things in the Old Testament to underscore, to emphasize, to make clear the work of Jesus on the cross. Take a look at, at, at these first four verses in chapter 5 with me. Man, I get excited about God's Word. I hope you're excited tonight. I hope you're excited. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. In relation to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. What's that verse saying? They're, they're appointed to be these temporary bridges connections between a holy God and a sinful man by offering sacrifices. And there's a disconnect there. Adam and Eve in the garden had perfect fellowship and communion with God. And they did what we all do. They seek to make themselves the Lord of their life. And they said, man, I'm going to eat from that tree. I'm going to do things my way because obviously I know better than the one that created everything. So let's try that out. And the fall of man and sin enters. And God says, being so perfect and so holy and so just and so righteous, I cannot have anything to do with sin. And that in history is when this divide came. That man can no longer just exist in the presence of God. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. The high priest who offers the imperfect temporary sacrifice is himself imperfect and sinful, just as the people he represents are imperfect and sinful. Verse 3 says, because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself. No one appoints themselves a high priest. No one says, hey, this is my, my cup I'm going to carry. There have been people in biblical history who've done that, and it doesn't work. No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as the coolest Bible character ever in history, Aaron, was. I remember moving from Minnesota to California and being surprised by how much there was culturally I didn't understand. If you've ever moved out of state or moved across the country or moved to a different country, you understand that. Showing up and going, 
I mean, there's a lot here I don't get. I'm missing. I don't, I don't understand. I, mean, I couldn't pronounce certain street names in cities. I remember I showed up the bridge, and I'm, I'm starting to, to pronounce all these, the, these um, Spanish names, and people are laughing as I'm giving announcements. I'm like, hey, y'all. Like, I'm from Minnesota. Everything we have is like Norwegian and Scandinavian, so you try pronouncing those, right? And, and I wasn't familiar with all this, the, the slang that people were using, and I wasn't really, I, I'd never eaten like real authentic Mexican food like Taco Bell was the extent of my like Mexican food knowledge till I got here then I had street tacos and it's been downhill for me ever since like (laughs) weight watchers out the window totally right and there's this moment I get here and I'm like man there's so much different And it wasn't really my fault or the, the fault of the people that now surrounded me but it was a situation that was created by the fact that I was raised in a different place with with, with different traditions and a different way of life where people talk differently and and they value different things where church closes down on fishing opener and hunting opener and I get here and everybody's like you can't have guns I was like what right? It's just different. And those things just happen. It's funny how from east coast to the best coast we all call ourselves American but can be so different. If you haven't experienced that, if you've lived in Southern California your whole life, travel to Alabama. It's going to become real clear to you just how different we can all be. And the same is true for this ragtag group of Jesus followers called Christians. I mean, that's been a mark of the church ever since Jesus started it. That the beauty of the church is in its diversity. That the strength of its church is in its diversity. Culturally speaking, a Jewish follower of Jesus is going to be different and understand the meaning behind these verses in a deeper and more profound way because of their background. Differently than the Gentile audience that Paul spent so much of his time talking to and writing to, differently than they would understand what's happening with this priestly order and this priestly system in the high. What? Like, they just understand it differently. So it's our job to be students of that culture and students of that background, students of the Old Testament, so that we better understand and relate to the truth of the text before us. The reality is, as a church, we could spend weeks studying the teachings of the the priestly order and the priestly duties set forth in the the Old Testament and the grain offerings and how much stuff has to weigh and how big it is, and and then you cut the lobe out of what? And you, you put it on the altar and then you do what? And you burn it. It's like, this is crazy, right? And wipe the blood where? Like, it's elaborate. It's extensive. It's in the Pentateuch. And and it's, it's crazy. We could spend weeks studying it, but for tonight's purposes and for the context of Hebrew 5, I want to specifically look at who the high priest is and what his role on a very special day in the Jewish year is, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement known as Yom Kippur was the most solemn, holy, special, important day of all the Israelite feasts and festivals. And it happened just once a year. On that day, the high priest was to perform an, an elaborate, complex ritual to atone for, to make amends for, it, or, or reparation for the sins of Israel and for the sins of the people he represented. We saw that in the beginning of Hebrews 5. There's a priest chosen from among men, appointed to act on behalf of men. Outlined with great detail, if you want to look at it or follow along as I kind of outline it, is it's in Leviticus 16. The atonement ritual began with, with Aaron or, or the, the high priest of Israel that, that followed him, the subsequent high priest, coming into the Holy of Holies, the physical dwelling place of God Almighty on earth, the room where the, the Ark of the Covenant was placed. This was the most sacred, special part of the tabernacle or the temple. The seriousness of the day was reiterated by God telling Moses to warn the high priest not to come into the most holy place in the tabernacle or the temple whenever he felt like it. This wasn't kicking it with God whenever you wanted. This wasn't busting open the door and say, yo, what's up to the big man upstairs? Like, this isn't, yo, hey, let's, let's, let's hang out for a while. No, this place was so revered and so special that, that God told Moses, don't you even think about coming into this place except for the one year, the Day of Atonement. Or else they would die. This was not a ceremony or day to be taken lightly. And the people were to understand that the atonement for sin was to be done God's way and only God's way. Before entering the tabernacle, Aaron, or the high priest, was 
to bathe and put on special priestly garments. And after he put on those garments, he was then to sacrifice a bull as a sin offering for for himself and his family. Exactly what the beginning of Hebrews says. The blood of the bull was to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. And then Aaron was to bring two goats, one to be sacrificed because of the uncleanness and the rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins had been. And its blood was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. This was brutal. I don't know if any of you have ever grown up on a farm and, and slaughtered an animal. But I tell you what, what you get in the grocery store doesn't start on the farm in the cellophane package. Something has to die to get it there, and it's messy. And, and it's, it's loud. And it's, it's gross. I mean, this was a bloodbath because of the seriousness of the offense against God. We've we got to see that. We're so far removed from that. We're so far removed from what that looks like and what that would smell like, and what that would sound like. But in that picture, you see the disgusting nature of sin. For the wages of sin is death. The other goat was used as a scapegoat. Aaron, or the high priest, was to place his hands on its head, confess over it the rebellion and wickedness of the Israelites, and send the goat out with an appointed man who released it into the wilderness. The goat carried on itself all the sins of the people which were forgiven for another year until the next Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. Why? Well, by doing this, the wrath of God, the wrath of God for the sin of the people would be appeased temporarily by the obedience of the high priest who served as a temporary bridge to God for the people. I said earlier that if I was living in Old Testament times, having my fear of danger and not being one who likes to risk my life, I'd look at that and be like, thank the Lord that's not my job. It's a dangerous job. It's a dangerous job. But bridges are important because they take us from where we are to where we need to be. If the high priest didn't do this exactly right, he would die. That's it. Simple. He didn't follow the instructions the right way. He didn't perform the rituals the right way. He didn't cleanse himself the right way. He didn't dress the right way. He didn't slaughter the animal the right way. He would go into the Holy of Holies and he would die. If he didn't cleanse himself correctly, he would die. If he didn't do all of these things just as they were outlined, he would die. If he, like Aaron's sons did, offer strange fire or perverse worship, he would die. I just want us to, to feel the weight of that for a moment. The seriousness of what's happening here is these animals are being killed for the sins of people. It was one of those dangerous jobs we talked about earlier. There's this tradition that isn't uh, in the Bible. Uh, we don't see it. It happened uh, much later, but it has been going on, or it happened for centuries. There's this tradition that the high priest of Israel would enter the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or the temple with a rope tied to his f- uh, feet and, or foot and bells around his waist. And tradition says that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, during the last couple of centuries of the temple, a scarlet rope was tied to his foot. And if the priest's sins were not atoned for properly, he would die in the presence of the Shekinah, the glory of God that filled the Holy of Holies. Since nobody else could enter that part of the temple without also dying, the the priests felt they needed a way to be able to retrieve the body of the high priest if necessary. So that was the purpose of the rope that was tied around his, his ankle. That they, they, they would pull the body out. The bells jingling would be a sign that the priest had fallen to the ground dead. It's a way to retrieve their, their friend. Now let's read those four verses with this sort of context fresh in our minds. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, the sinful, since he himself is beset with weakness. 
Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. That was the old system. That was the old covenant. Now the writer of Hebrews is is going to show us that Jesus' superiority as the final and the perfect high priest. That's the theme of the book. Jesus is superior. Jesus is better. Jesus is greater than anything, anyone else, or any other system, or any other religion, period, done. In the beginning, we talked about Jesus is greater than the prophets. Chapter 1, greater than the prophets, greater than the founding fathers of the faith. He's greater than angels. He's greater than all these things. And the writer's now going to show that Jesus' superiority is the final and perfect high priest in verse 5. It says, So also Christ did not exalt Himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by Him, appointed by God, who said to Him, You are My Son. Today I have begotten You. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, verse 4. Jesus is the final, the perfect, the great high priest. And not temporarily, and not until another high priest come, but he is the high priest forever. What does this mean? What does it mean for you, 2018, sitting in this chair? You're going to go home tonight? Probably eat a bowl of cereal you shouldn't eat before you watch some Netflix. Wake up tomorrow, go to, go, to, go to work. What are you shaking your head no for? Cereal's the best meal ever. Anyways, I digress. You're going to go on with your life is what I'm trying to say. So what does it have to do with me? I love asking those three questions when you read the Bible. You should ask them. What does this mean? Why is it important? How does it impact me? When you go to Scripture, you can say, God, what does it mean? Why does it matter? And what should I do when I, how should I change in in light of it? What does it mean? Why is it important? How does it impact me? These are great questions. The point of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ, God's begotten Son, has not just come to fit into the earthly system of priestly ministry that existed prior to His coming. But He has come to fulfill and put an end to that system once and for all. Because He is superior and greater, He has come to direct all of our attention on Himself, ministering for us on our behalf to the Father in heaven. The Old Testament tabernacle, the Old Testament priest, the sacrifices were all shadows. They were just shadows of the real thing. They were shadows of the real deal. Now the real thing has come and the shadows pass away. Jesus fulfills and brings to an end the official priesthood. He he fulfills and brings to an end the the sacrificial offerings. Sometimes in our new believers class where I'm sitting down with somebody, well, why don't we do all of that stuff in the Old Testament? What happened to all of that? There's so much in the Pentateuch. Why why don't we take the bull and cut it open and, and sacrifice all this? Why don't we do it? He fulfills and brings an end to the sacrificial offerings. Jesus fulfills and brings an end to the dietary laws. He fulfills and brings to an end the priestly vestments. He he fulfills and brings to an end the the seasonal acts of atonement and reconciliation. Jesus fulfills and He brings to an end the physical center of Old Testament worship, the tabernacle and the temple. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about with the woman at the well? Just remember with me for a moment. Jesus is traveling with His disciples. He gets tired. He finds this well. He's kicking it there for a little bit. His disciples go to find some, some grub. And while He's there, this Samaritan woman comes and they just have this crazy countercultural conversation that never should have happened with a rabbi and a Samaritan ever. But Jesus didn't much care because He was always placing value on people even when other people said they aren't valuable. So He's like, I'm going to talk to this lady. And He starts talking about living water and drinking the living water and starts like, adding value to her life and speaking truth into her life and she's getting uncomfortable and then Jesus just like brings it to the next level and he's like hey your life's kind of a mess and I still love you like you don't have to change I love you but you should change because it's a mess and she's like you're with like five dudes and none of them are your husband and she's like what (laughs) it's like biblical Jerry Springer like what'd you say to me and she does the funniest thing she changes the subject which is what I would have done. Uh, let's talk about something else, Jesus. Check it out. It's John chapter 4, verse 20. It should be on the screen. <laughs> he just says, like, your life's a mess. 
busted. And she goes, well, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. (laughs) Good move. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. What's the deal? Where's God? Where do I need to go to get close to God? What do I need to do to feel God's presence? I'm not sure we ask very different questions. Maybe it's not about a temple or about a mountain, but God, what do I need to do to to, to, to be in Your presence? Where do I need to go? Just give me the rules and the list and I'll I'll do it. Let me fulfill it so I can finally be with you. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that it's Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, I just love, the Bible doesn't say how he talks, but I just hear this soft, patient voice. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. And there's like eight sermons in there, but I'll move on. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour's coming. It's here. It's now. Can you, can you taste it? Can you see it? Can you feel it? When the true worshipers, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman says, I, I, I know that there's a, a Messiah. That whole part of the Bible that comes before Matthew and Bethlehem, like I've heard the stories and the rumors, what the prophets have said. I, I've heard that there's a Messiah coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us. You don't know what you're talking about. He'll tell us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. When Jesus hung on the cross, he hung there as the final, perfect, undeniable sacrifice for sin. He was the final atonement. Do you remember what happened when Jesus died? After the Garden of Gethsemane. And after they came with a mob and an army to arrest him, even though he went peacefully. After Peter took a sword and just like sliced some dude's ear off. And Jesus is like, nope, sorry. And they take him and and they go through this whole process. And he's finally, he's hanging on the cross. And in Matthew 27, verse 45, it says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, abandoned me, turned your back on me, taken your presence away from me? God, why? I've never lived, I've never experienced you without your presence, and now you're gone. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and they took a sponge, they filled it with sour wine and they put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. They're still mocking him. They're still down. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. And he gave up. He, he yielded his spirit. He was always in control. The sovereign creator of all things never even lost control in his last moment. He yielded his spirit. What happened? Then behold. (laughs) Behold is usually before really important stuff. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What veil? These aren't window dressings and curtains. I mean, this was an elaborate, beautifully woven thick, heavy veil that separated the temple from the Holy of Holies. This was the separation. 
This was the thing that the priest needed to cleanse himself and wash himself and dress himself and sacrifice just the right way to even go beyond it. And Jesus yields his spirit and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Not just a little hole, not just a little bit, all the way done. The holy of holies is now open. The earth quaked and the rocks split. And the graves were opened and many, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion, those with Him, were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, seeing, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. The one that the people of God had been waiting for. The veil was torn. The veil that separated man from the Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God, the place where only the high priest was allowed to enter once a year after a crazy purification process. That veil was torn. There was now no separation between God and man because of what Jesus did on the cross. Woman, I tell you, there is a time coming. The hour is now when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go on this mountain because I am going to make a way to God myself. Jesus has removed the barrier to God. Jesus is the bridge between us and God. We don't, we don't need the old system. But it's tradition. We don't need the old system. It's done. Jesus has come in and He's taken control. He is now the bridge between us and God. And bridges are important, right? Because bridges take us where we are to where we need to be. And once and for all, Jesus stands and he, he bridges the gap. The point, the main, the, the main point of it all is that the one priest who goes between us and God and makes us right with God and prays for us to God is not an ordinary, weak, sinful, dying priest like the Old Testament days. He is the living, all-powerful Son of God, strong, sinless, with an indestructible life. He is the perfect high priest forever. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5-6, through I think I put this up. So this, there's one God. There's one mediator between God and men. It's the man, and I love what Phil said last week. The Bible literally calls him the man, right? There's one. It's, it's Christ. It's the Messiah. Christ is not a middle or last name for Jesus. It's the Greek word for the Messiah. There is one mediator. There is one bridge. There is one hope. There's only one way to God. It, it is the Messiah, Jesus. And how did He do it? He gave Himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Go back to Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace where we were once separated. Draw near to the place we could never get. Draw near to the place that we were separated from that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. What's on the other side of the bridge, man? It's everything you were created to need. Mercy and grace and help. Man, that's what Jesus bridges for us tonight. Jesus is the superior sacrifice. The superior, the final high priest. And just as the end of Hebrews 4 says, chapter 5 continues to show us that Jesus is not a distant, dispassionate, angry Savior and High Priest. We project so many of our earthly human experiences onto God. 
And I've sat with countless people who had angry and abusive dads who who said mean things and were unkind. And now they they look at this God the Father with a distorted reality that He is distant and He is angry and He he is unpleased and and He's just upset with you all the time. Listen here. He is a personal, compassionate, empathetic Savior and friend. Look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, when he walked on earth 33 years. You know that Jesus could have come in one day and said, hey y'all, I'm the Son of God. Believe it. And taking care of business like that. 33 years he labored on an imperfect, broken planet to walk with his creation. Let's not let those simple truths pass by us tonight. In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications confidently and with no emotion because He was God. No, with loud cries and tears. Some of your translations say vehement cries. I don't know if you've ever been there where the news you receive feels like it's the news that's going to kill you and you got nothing but a whale. Nothing but just like the most agonizing scream you can produce. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to Him, to God who was able to save Him from death and was heard because of His reverence. It was Jesus when in the Garden of Gethsemane He pleaded, He, 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 he begged God, let this cup pass from Me. Jesus struggled with the difficulty of obedience but chose to obey perfectly. Do you ever find it difficult to obey God? If you don't, you should just take My place and start preaching. The answer is yes. All the time, if you've ever said, God, I'm going to obey you, whatever you say. (laughs) Tomorrow you'll fail. You ever find it difficult to obey His Word, to obey the urging of the Holy Spirit at all times? Scott walks into my office and we just have this like divine conversation about walking and living in the Spirit and how you have it for a moment. And you're like, yes! And then you go to do it all the time and you're like, no! (laughs) I fail! Find it difficult to do what is right even when everyone would understand if you didn't. Man, so did Jesus. As difficult as that is to wrap our heads around in His humanity, it was a struggle. Verse 8 says, although He was a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation. Amen to all who obey Him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Mel. Is a deck. William Lane, a commentator, says when we read Hebrews, it becomes evident that the sermon was addressed to people whose world was falling apart. The fact that they were Christians brought no privilege for them at all. In fact, it appeared to mark them out for a fresh, greater experience of suffering. For them, the cost of discipleship was to be measured in terms of the loss of property, their freedom, and perhaps even their lives. Do you ever feel like your world is falling apart? Do you ever feel like the cost of following Jesus is is too high? Do you ever feel like obedience to God means certain suffering somewhere else? I do. All the time. I do. What was it that Jesus said to his followers? The heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah. Hit the nail on the head. It's hard. But the good news is we have a high priest, a Savior, who understands what it's like to struggle and to suffer. I remember a few different times in my life when suffering, when we talked about that agonizing cry, was seemed like the norm for us. I think back to when my brother was sick and it was like two years of just hospital hell or uh, another season where we just had multiple miscarriages and you're like lord why and there were certain people that came along and they 
They'd offer trite sayings of sympathy or the worst thing you could ever say to someone when they're hurting. Hey, don't worry. It's all going to be okay. And don't say that to someone whose life is falling apart. Counseling 101, don't. But there were other people who would come and sit with you in silence and cry tears and hurt with you because they had suffered too through something similar. And those were the most powerful I have someone there and say, man, yeah, that hurts and that sucks and, and I actually know what that's like and I'm here, I'm walking it through with you. And Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything He was unwilling to do Himself. He doesn't demand an obedience greater than He displayed and He looks at us in our suffering, in our seeking after God and He understands. You're not alone tonight. You're not in this alone. You don't face this alone. Whatever obstacle lies before you, whatever impossible thing, whatever hurt and pain lies before you, it is real. And I can't tell you something out of a magic box that's going to make your pain go away. But what I know from the truth of Scripture and as He's walked through it with me, you don't face this alone. For the very one who cried out in anguish in the garden that night is the one who defeated evil and darkness on the cross once and for all. And He is for you. He is not against you. Amen? Amen. Come on. I've been saying some good news tonight for some of you. It's life-giving. It, it, it fills your life with purpose and hope that although I struggle and I feel pain, I have someone with me who took it to the cross and He's walking it through with me every step of the way. Every step of the way. Verse 11, about this we have much to say. I'm sure, so do I, but time is wrapping up. And it is hard to explain. These mysteries of God, they're weird. You know what the craziest thing about this is? I can tell you that Jesus will be there for you in your pain. But unless you turn to Him in your pain, you'll never experience it. You, you, <laughs> these things are not meant to be known and downloaded like a file on your computer to open later. They are meant to be lived in and walked in and experienced so that they become real. And they're saying about this, we have much to say. It's super hard to explain unless you live it and are there since you have become dull of hearing. David Guzik says being dull of hearing is not a problem with the ears but a problem with the heart. It's a problem where the hearer isn't really interested in what God has to say anymore. And he says not wanting to hear the Word of God points to a genuine spiritual problem. The word become is important. It indicates that they didn't start out dull of hearing, but became that way after time. Where are you tonight? Are your ears, your heart open to the things of God? Have you drifted into a monotonous, dull walk with the Lord? Here's a little secret for your relationship with the Lord, for, for your relationship with your, you, with your spouse, with, with your relationship with your kids. No one ever drifts towards intimacy. You get there on purpose by paddling the right way day after day, Hour after hour. No one drifts closer to God. You get close to God when you seek Him, when you run to Him, when you don't let your, your ears become dull of hearing. Do you still desire to hear from Him? I told you I meant what I said when I pray. I pray He is waiting to speak to you. Are your ears open? Are His words life-giving and sustaining to you? What we'll see is that when we drift towards complacency in our relationship with the Lord and the things of God, we aren't who God has called us to be individually or corporately. And this is kind of the assessment that the writer of Hebrews makes of his audience. Verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. <laughs> Some of you think the fix to your relationship with the Lord is another Bible study and, and more information. He's saying, you, you've heard it. You're not walking it out. <laughs> you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk. 
not solid food. He uses this like really intentional analogy about children to draw this parallel to spiritual immaturity. It's normal for a baby to be sustained by milk, but it's a disgusting thought to think an adult would feed themselves that way. And he's saying, what's wrong with you? You you haven't grown up. Grow up! You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled. Yeah, babies don't walk. They don't talk real great. They're unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food, meat, experiencing the Lord, consuming the word, and then letting it take root in your heart and living it out is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. He's saying, hey, if that's you, you're not who you're supposed to be. You're not who you're called to be. So, so what are we supposed to be? What are we called to be? And I'm running out of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this quick. Well, in Exodus, can you turn to Exodus 19 real quick? It's going to be on the screens. In Exodus, we see God miraculously delivers people from slavery uh, through miracle after miracle after he's led the people of Israel out of captivity uh, to the place where he spoke to Moses. God gives this message to the people. Super cool in Exodus 19. We're going to look at verses 4 through 6. It says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you, he's talking to the people of God, all of Israel, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests? What happened? I heard we were just talking about there's the select few, the, the Aaron's descendants, they're the priests, the high priests. What's God talking about here? Well, the people end up rejecting God's unmediated voice and elect Moses to hear from God directly on their behalf. It's Deuteronomy 5.28. I was going to read it, but there it is. Check it out. A few verses later, God establishes Aaron's line as the line of priests to Israel. And from that time on, we see the priestly order and duties that we've talked about all night here established. And it seems like commissioning a kingdom of priests is temporarily put on hold. Jesus comes. He serves as the, the great and final high priest. And what we've studied and what we stand in awe of tonight is all true. But, but what about God's plan to have a nation of priests? What happened to Exodus 19? Did Israel's failure change God's plan forever? Well, look at, quickly turn to to 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's been so fun teaching this book to our young adults on Monday nights. We went through 1 Peter, which is like how to live differently for the Lord. It's, whoo, it's good. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. A holy nation. I think, I think Peter was Jewish. I think he's recalling these words. A holy nation, a people for his own position, possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. God's plan to establish a people of priests is fulfilled in the church. It's fulfilled in the church. The gathering of his post-resurrection, new covenant, Jesus following people. Amazingly, we are made royal priests by union to our great high priest, our King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. Pastor Ryan Shelton writes this, just like the warriors of Israel needed a priest on the day of battle, we gather to remind our fellow priest warriors of God's great promises. We sing familiar songs with repeated promises in our worship. We look one another in the eye as fleshly representatives of God's invisible kingdom. God made you a royal priest to proclaim His excellencies. We proclaim Him to the nations, but also to our brothers and sisters at church. As you sing, don't be fooled into thinking we know these truths already. We need the reminder we have priestly duties when we meet. This is who we are to be. This is what the church should be. This is who you should be. 
Not like the immature believer that the writer of Hebrews addresses at the end of chapter 5. We have too far important of a job to let ourselves become dull of hearing because Jesus has removed the barrier to God. Because Jesus is the bridge between us and God, taking us where we are to where we need to be because Jesus is the superior, perfect, great high priest. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. And here's my benediction, that you may proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Let's pray together.